Hi, my name is Dr. Raja Adnan Ahmed and I am a psychiatrist and I work in UK. And this morning I got uh, Dr. Lavik Afzal, who is uh, an IMG from Pakistan and who's currently working as an uh, IMT uh, doctor in training in West Midlands in the UK. And he's a very young graduate, I think, from at least from my point of view, he's only graduated from 2019. And he has, he's been able to secure IMD training in UK, which a lot of Pakistani, Indian and other IMG doctor aspire to. So I thought I'll ask Dr. Azul to come on uh, my YouTube channel or my platform to actually share his experience. So Dr. Azul, thank you very much for uh, joining me and giving me the time. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Ahmed. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, I used to watch your videos throughout my, you know, my journey to the UK and even meeting you in person. It was quite, I would say, whatever you're doing, you know, in terms of career counseling, in terms of, you know, bringing the young people together to guide the next generation. I think that's marvelous. And I'm really, really excited to be part of, you know, this, this, uh, this meeting today and this podcast today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you tell us briefly about your journey so far as a doctor? That how did you come to this point? Yeah, so as you said, I I graduated in twenty nineteen, basically. So uh, from I'm actually from Faisalabad, Pakistan. So I did my MBBS from there. Uh, then I did my house job, which is equivalent to you know we say foundation kind of foundation training in in the UK. So during uh, my house job, um, I did my OET. I did my mm -hmm. you know the language exams. You can do either IELTS or OET. And then as soon as my house job was finished, uh, I was sitting for PLAB 1. So I did my PLAB 1 and then I did my PLAB 2 as well uh, after I would say six or, I would have six or seven months. So this was 2021 when I did my, when I came to the UK for the first time to do my PLAB 1, uh, sorry, PLAB 2. Uh, I would say it was quite a uh, uh, exhaustive journey, I would say, uh, considering when you are coming from a country like Pakistan or India or Bangladesh or, you know, other, like, I would say it's it's same across the board in for other IMGs as well, uh, that it's, it's, it's become so expensive um, and the uncertainty of the pathway and, you know, all these things happen and the journey is quite financially struggling, I would say. So I, I, I said for my PLAB too, uh, unfortunately, I didn't make it that time. So I went back to Pakistan, uh, you know, and, but at the same time, I was applying for the Ireland registration as well. So Republic of Ireland, which is a different country than the UK, uh, it's not about Northern Ireland, it's a different country. So I was going for that registration as well. And two days after I failed my exam, I got a job offer from Ireland. So I wanted to come to the UK, uh, but somehow, you know, that's how the... Mm -hmm. You know, the Allah Almighty has planned for me. So I went to Ireland. I worked there for one and a half year. During that time, I built my portfolio uh, because I ultimately wanted to apply for the INT. So I kept working there. Um, I did all, you know, it was in my mind that what the criteria is. And I kept working on my criteria and my application scoring for, mm -hmm. for INT. And so I moved to the UK uh, before, after applying to IMT. So last year in October, I applied for IMT. And in December, um, uh, I wasn't, uh, I think, shortlisted that time, but I, I moved to the UK because I wanted to show some commitment that I want to work in this country. I want to get to know the NHS system. And then by the time I get the interview, I should have this in as my, you know, standing. So I got shortlisted. I appeared for the interview. And now here I am I'm currently working as an internal medicine trainee, which is called IMT, um, or you can say I am resident um, in the UK, uh, in the West Midlands. That's good. I think that's a very inspiring journey. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening to you who are young graduates will uh, get some inspiration because, as you said, a lot of people are going to Ireland. Although I know uh, getting a job in Republic of Ireland is also not uh, very easy these days because there's a saturation there as well. But this is one of the pathways people are using because they are yeah. similar. Would you say it's a similar system in Ireland? Because if you came from, we worked in Ireland, has that helped you in terms of working in the UK as well? Uh, I would say definitely it's not like like our country back home. Uh, it's definitely a Western country, uh, mm -hmm. and they have kind of similarities with the UK. But still, 
I thought I had like, you know, learned enough or, you know, I have worked enough in the, in the Ireland, so I can easily adjust in the UK, but the work culture, sometimes it, it's different in the UK. The services are more developed. I would say there is more, uh, you know, services, more people, more professionals yeah. and the work staff, you know, the working force is, is more, I would say diver- diverse, I would say in the UK. So that's different than Ireland, but Ireland is on perks and we yeah. can have another video, you know, on the pros and cons of both countries. Uh, but I would say, approximately 60 to 70 percent it's same uh you know um how the works go how the raffle things you know the mdts we, we are not used to these things back home mm-hmm. so that's something I, I i learned in in ireland as well but then when i came to the uk there are a few things i struggled with because that's how nhs works mm-hmm. so uh in terms of imd application i think this is the main reason i asked you to come because we just wanted to hear your experience of what was the experience of going through the IMT ex- uh, internal medicine training application. So we are recording okay. this in October of 2024 when the application for August 2025 are currently open. Um, yes. And, you know, some of the information we'll share now maybe may, may become uh, outdated and, you know, and it might get updated for, for the future. Just, just for the say reference, I always say that always check the official website for the current guidelines. But from your um, experience, obviously you applied for it in October, you said, 2023. Uh, after your application, what was the next step? You know, you obviously you, you, you submit your CREST form. That CREST form is assessed by the, uh, by the recruit, recruiting team. And then when they, once they lo- long list you, I mean, what are the things they're looking for? What is the step there to get to the next stage? Yeah. So I think uh, before moving to the shortlisting, I would say the main thing is the application itself. Yeah. So if you don't fill the application correctly, if you don't know, like the main problem I see with ourselves and IMG is like we are very underconfident. Uh, We have done a lot of stuff. We have done a lot of portfolio things which are not in the portfolio, but we have done it in past, but we don't have the evidence for that. We, we, We think this is not enough and that's tend to make us, you know, underscore ourselves or, you know, make us underconfident as compared to the local residents, you know, because they are used to this system. So I would say the first thing is to, uh, have a like make it very clear for yourself that you need to spend a lot of time for your application and before the application opens so let's say i give an example so if you want to start in 2026 august you need two years before to start preparing so because the one year is the whole year which will you start you, for example if you apply now you will start your job in august so if you want to start in august 2025 you should be preparing last year for your portfolio if you don't have anything at all i think one year is more than enough currently to to secure all the things which are required to you know to get a sh- to get it shortlisted, so I've seen people I've helped people this year uh, to make their portfolio to help them guard you know which can what things can be scored. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the most important point that you need to fill your application very rightly, very correctly. Don't underscore yourself, but don't un- overestimate yourself as well. So you need to make a very good balance. So that's where we lack in. So once the application is filled, um, and before that the crest form, I think that's the main you know kind of a pain in. You know, there's a main pain point, I would say. A lot of people struggle with crest form as well. So I got my crest form signed from Ireland as well. Uh, you can get it signed from your back home. The main thing is anyone can sign it as long as it's a consultant. But the problem, people find it, they don't have the evidence that the person is working at the consultant level. So that even happened with me. You know, I was working in Ireland. Uh, I thought my consultant who is a, you know, she's an Irish consultant. She's on a, like a full substantive consultant post. Her name is as a consultant on the Irish Medical Council. Like she is, you know, uh, she have done all this uh, uh, the same way we it appears on GMC. Yeah. But in re rejected my crest form because they just wanted something more. I'm not sure what exactly they want. They wanted the in date, uh, you know, the registration license, you know, the certificate of uh, current practice mm-hmm. from the consultant. So here I would like to credit my, you know, my supervisor at that time, Dr. Paula Hickey. She was absolutely amazing. It was. Uh, it was a weekend. I only had two days to submit my, you know, uh, my evidence. And I just texted her that I'm in a problem. She was off holidays, but she took time to send me that, you know, download that form. And mm. So it was still amazing. So this is the main point. The crest form is the first thing. Make it sure you get it checked with two, three people before you submit it. The evidence should be very right. It shouldn't be, you know, because they only give you two to three days to, to correct your mistake. Mm. So the second thing is application. The third thing is not shortlisting. So what happens is when you have filled the application, uh, you will know your score. Uh, it's like a self-assessment that you score yourself out of, let's say, this year it's 30 marks. Last year it was 40 marks. So they have mm-hmm. changed the criteria. So as you said, mo- maybe some of the information may be outdated by the time people hear this in 2025, but at least 50 to 60% of the content will remain the same. So this year what changed is 
uh, there is no marks for leadership. Uh, there's no marks for managerial skills. So last year, there were marks for leadership. Like if you hold a leadership position uh, back home or in the UK, like any kind of leadership position. So you can get yourself yeah. vote for that. So this year it's not. So you will know your marks. Uh, for example, you score, let's say, 16 out of 30. So you know this is your score. And once the application period is over, so this year it will be 21st of November. So once this is over, uh, then they will start long listing. So the long list, which means your crest form is, I think, accepted and your application doesn't have any major red flags. Uh, or for example, let's say their initial criteria was, we're gonna short long list people who are more than 10. I'm not sure about the exact uh, criteria they choose, but I think that's how it works. Like if it's more than 10, you get long listed, for example, mm -hmm. for that year. And then I think, I'm not sure about this year, but I think it's 16th of December or something today, this year, then you will get shortlisted, which is, yeah. means you are finally invited to have, you know, to have an interview, for example. So shortlisting is based on how other people scored yeah. against you. Uh, so it's like, you know, uh, last year it was, I believe, 14 marks, uh, I think 14 or 15 marks, you know, for shortlisting. That was a cutoff. Yeah. A year before it was 12. So this means that the competition is rising. Last year yeah. it was 43, approximately 43% more applicants. Yeah. Uh, so I'm expecting there will be approximately the same number of amount of applicants this mm. year as well. But that doesn't mean you're at disadvantage. So if you are working in the UK or if you're not even working in the UK, as long as you have the evidence. So like I think UK is a beautiful country in that sense. So even if you're not working here, if you have the evidence, if you have done that work that is required, if that's standard work and that's, you know, can be validated so you can get the training mm. without any you know, uh, visa restrictions or anything like this so this doesn't happen mm. i think in the country so this is what the beauty of uk is so just make sure you have the portfolio you have all the applications criteria mm. you're shortlisted and then you book for the interview so i think okay. yeah i think uh, i just clarify a few points uh, for the img so number one people ask whenever we talk about training posts they always ask about msr exam so the MSR exam does not have any any role in IMT recruitment. So the two major specialties which are not using MSRA is the pediatrics and the internal medicine training. It doesn't have MSRA exam as part of that. So, but, but if you're applying for GP, psychiatry, Optangani, uh, core surgical training, then MSRA is part of that. So as Dr. Abdul was explaining that the, here, the main thing is that you submit your crest form and your application. But the main thing here is, which is making you shortlisted is your portfolio, which means that you need to start working on building your portfolio early and then able to show that those marks. I think the marks he's talking about is what we call the self-ranking. So they have given different domains in the yes. in the application that there are certain marks for research, certain marks if you have done an audit or quality improvement project, if you've done other other things, then they will add up. So rather than they marking you, they ask you to to mark yourself and then submit that. And then they will verify if you've given yourself right marks or not. And given based on that, you'll get a score. So can you uh, can you explain some of the domains which people can mark to keep people can score on? I mean, obviously, by by the way, this is all available on the IMT website that how how they want to score, how what is the um, what is the different domains you, you score yourself on? But from the IMG's point of view, what sort of things you know will actually make them score? If you, if you don't mind just uh, informing us about some of them. Yeah. So currently there are six major domains or the, yeah. six, the only six domains that you can score in yourself. So yeah. I would I say to this, everybody who comes to me that uh, there's no, I would say, a standard template that I can give you. Uh, to help you score because yeah. everybody's different. They, I have seen people who are like, who are, you know, who have plenty of research experience so they can mark higher in research. Yeah. Then there are people like me who are, you know, like graduated in the last four years. They don't have much research exposure. They don't have, you know, other opportunities or they were working hard to, you know, yeah. for the service provision jobs. So it, it depends what your strength is, what you can do. For example, some people are good at research. Some people are good at QIPs. Some people are good at presentations. So it all depends uh, I would say if, you know, uh, so it's all about, you know, how you, how you spend your energies, I would say. For example, there is, uh, let's talk about the research. So there is one criteria, like you can score yourself uh, for research. Uh, like, let's say if you have a publication, uh, if you're a first author, if you're a joint first author or mm -hmm. corresponding author of one or more PubMed cited original research publications. All right. So if you have done a research, as an undergraduate or you know after graduation or in postgraduate years if you have done it 
uh, that's very good. Like you can do eight marks. So eight marks means you are already halfway through shortlisting because probably it will be, I'm not too sure what exact, but I think if last year was 15, so we can imagine it would be the same this year, considering uh, the total marks has decreased mm -hmm. by 10 points. So if you have got eight marks in research, then you're already halfway through. But for somebody who hasn't got a research, then he would know that getting a PubMed cited original research article published is not that easy comparing to some other things that we can score in the criteria. For example, yeah. if you do a QIP, uh, you do two cycles and you present it in one of the national conferences, I find it much easier than publishing an article in a yeah. PubMed cited journal. But some people would have more experience and they will find it more easier to do that. So I think that's the main thing to identify your strengths, like just go through, because when I was start doing that, I spend like at least one hour daily for to read the application criteria because every time when I read the, all the, you know, uh, the fine print, yeah. I would find, okay, so this is something I can do and this is something which is not relevant, all right? Mm -hmm. For example, so this year, I will give you an example. Uh, there, there, there's a domain called teaching. So if you have a teaching experience, you can mark yourself, you know, you can score yourself. So there, there were a few courses by the NHS, uh, which was like teach the trainer course. Uh, they were like, you know, yeah. what we call it, like offline or, you know, web-based like video series course. Previously, it was accepted, but I think seven or eight days ago, they changed the criteria. Now they want the course to be synchronous live teaching, you know. Mm. So if you have done that course, you are already losing one mark now. So this is how it works. So I think if you go through, I, I'm going to briefly through all the criteria. So first is the, uh, no, sorry, first is the postgraduate degrees. So you can score four marks if you have PhD or MD by research. But I think for young graduates, that's very unlikely. Yeah, unlikely, yeah. Yeah, so it's very unlikely. So there's no point, you know, boiling your blood, you know, why I can't do this. Second is, if you have a master level degree, MSc, MA, you know, something like that. Still, I would say it's very unlikely for young graduates to have this. But mm. there are a few people who came to the UK on, you know, student visas. They yeah. have them MSCs. So they can score this mark. Then third point is, if you have any kind of diploma, like mm. a postgraduate diploma, which is kind of one to 10 months. So now yeah. here it comes. You need to research something which you can do easily within one to 10 months. And that can let you have one yeah. mark. All right. So previously it used to be like BSc, you know, that yeah. we used to do in Pakistan. So uh, like English BSc, but I think it's not there anymore. Yeah. So you can do a diploma. There are plenty of diplomas available. You can find um, a cheaper one. You can find an expensive one. You can do from the UK. You can do from overseas. Yeah. So it's all up to you where you want to uh, do it. So, but I think this is something which is very doable. If you start early, you can do like three months diploma uh, part-time with your job and it will score you one mark. All right. Mm. Then second thing would be presentations. So in pre terms of presentations, you can score six marks if you have an oral. So six is the highest mark in this yeah. domain. You can have oral presentation in which you are the first or the second author at a national or international meeting. Mm. All right. So it could be anything. For example, the way I guide people is to do a QIP. All right. And do the two cycles, then present it in a national conference. So you can score you know, highest marks in both domains. And yeah. this is acceptable, you know. You do a QIP, it will give you, I think, six marks or five yeah. marks. Let me check. Uh, yeah, so it will give you four marks, which is the highest yeah. in the QIP. And then you present it mm. as an oral or a poster presentation, and then you can score either four or six marks. So that gives you 10 marks. So yeah. you are already two quarter, uh, you know, closer to your goal. Mm. And for national conference, it could be in the England, it could be in the Scotland, UK, uh, like, any of the UK four nations yeah. or, you know, if it's not international, like for example, there are a few conferences in the UK which have European delegates. Yeah. So that's would be the national conference. So you can present in that. And I think it's it's easier because there are plenty of options available, but you yeah. have to start early, at least six months early because the deadline closes, I think within two, three months before the event happens. So this is the second point which you can do in terms of your presentations. Now publications, as I told earlier, if you have a research, that's very good. Yeah. If not, then you can start with the writing case report, which is, yeah. I think, relatively easier. Uh, if you're working in the UK, I think, or even in Pakistan, in, in Bangladesh, in Egypt, anywhere in the, in, the, in the country, in the world. So if you have done a case, you can present a case report, which is much easier to do. If yeah. you don't have a research experience, it will give you three marks. So again, th at least something is better than nothing. And all these needs to be, I, uh, I think, PubMed cited. Yes. So yeah. PubMed cited journals you need to identify. There are a few journals in PubMed which you know which can help you publish for free as well. So you need to identify that. I don't want to name them. Uh, so you can 
use those. You can present, uh, mm -hmm. publish your case report, and you can score three marks. If not, the last mark is one mark, which is for non-PubMed cited journals, which could yeah. be your national journal in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Egypt. But I think, from my experience, I have published in those journals as well. But problem was, the amount of work that I did was the same that I would be doing for BMJ, you know? Yeah. So uh, I think there's no point to do that. So just aim for the higher journals, you yeah. know? So I think that would be much better in the long run. Though, So this is, uh, I think, the third domain. Yeah, so this is the third one. Fourth is the teaching experience. As I told earlier, if you have worked, so I think most of us, most of the IMGs can score at least three marks in this domain because mm -hmm. uh, most of us has, have taught uh, you know, uh, in our medical school, uh, sorry, in our foundation years, in our postgraduate years, the only thing we're lacking is we don't have any uh, formal experience or sorry, formal evidence for that. So even if you don't have that and you don't want to start now, you just yeah. start early. So that's why the one year window would help you. So you yeah. start early, speak with your local tutors. <clears throat> they are <throat> undergraduate tutors for foundation years for undergraduate medical students in the UK. Overseas as well, you will have medical students. Talk to your supervisor, talk to the people who is heading their educational plan offer your services, I think nobody's going to refuse you because they're getting a helping hand. So you just help them arrange the teaching, you help them uh, sourcing, you know, different speakers, different presentation uh, presenters, and you also present yourself or you also teach yourself for at least three months. So that's the main criteria. If you don't have the document saying you have done this for three months, it's not accepted. Yeah, so, so it's, it's not just a one-off talk. It's, it's basically something you yeah. have run for three months. Yes. So because if you want to do like a one off talk, for example, mm -hmm. uh, it will be only one mark. So it says mm -hmm. I have taught medical students and other healthcare professionals occasionally, which could be one or two or, yeah. you know, you have two or three evidence forms. But if it's not a regular thing, you can't score three marks. Yeah. So that's very important in IMT because that's what I found. The website is very helpful. Uh, the wording, you know, the criteria is very important, yeah. the way you understand it, because sometimes people overestimate themselves or underestimate themselves and ultimately end mm -hmm. up having their application rejected or getting into, you know, property issues. So I think that's the main thing you need to discuss with people who have done it before. So the fourth domain would be, so this is the fourth domain. The fifth one is teaching and training, sorry, training and teaching, uh, which is if you have done a PG cert or PG diploma. So yeah. I think this is not common overseas, but yeah. in the UK, it's very common for people to have a PG cert, which is PG yeah. certificate. Uh, which usually I'm not sure, but please correct me wrong. If it's, I think it's for one year part time in some cases, or it could be full time for six yeah, months. Yeah, in medical education, yeah, yeah I think it's it's sort of uh, sometimes some of the schemes here have have been offering it for free for their own trainees as well. That if you work yes. in that place for a non training yeah. job, they can give you uh, time to study for a PG certificate and fund that. Yeah. So you Definitely. know that it's for people. They encourage people to be, to become uh, you know academic. So that's why it's, it's it's for them. But you're right. It's not very common for somebody who's coming from Pakistan or India. I think in yes. Pakistan they started doing some uh, certificates and some in there some is, yeah. qualification in education, but it's not still not that common. Yeah. So like a few months ago, I was seeing you know there's a university in the in Islamabad in Pakistan, which is offering like remote you know PG cert in medical education. So I think that's so in Pakistan it's called health professional education. Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of similar of you know PG certain medical education. So you can do those, or you can do from UK as well. The cheapest I found so far is like twenty three hundred pounds uh, in the UK. You can do that. You can pay installments, or mm -hmm. even if you're working in trust, you I would suggest is try to get its post, which which is kind of a clinical fellow post. So mm -hmm. those you know people uh, who are working as a clinical fellow, mm -hmm. uh, they are same as ST one or two level as same like post FY2 level, uh, but the trust will sponsor their PG cert. So it's kind of a standard practice across the, you know, like the trust I'm working in. I have a few fellows who are like clinical mm -hmm. fellows. They used to teach for three days, work clinically for two days, and the trust sponsored like 3,000 worth of PG cert. Mm -hmm. And they can help you uh, do that as well. So I think this is something which is not easily doable, but still this is something yeah. which is not beyond your uh, control. So I think just aim for it. If not, then you can do some simple courses, which is kind of a, uh, one day course like six hours teaching at least and you can score one mark so this okay. is kind of easy you know as well and the last thing is qip so yeah. i think that's the uk uh medical practice is kind of founded on the qip you know yeah. um the the ethics of qip so everybody has to do a qip at, at, at some point in their career in the uk yeah. so better start early if you don't know how to do do a qip uh, you can reach out to your, you know, seniors. Like I know someone who reached out to his, you know, resident, like his uh, specialty registrar. He was doing an audit and they got involved. He helped yeah. and so 
what you know uh, gets coded on and when i was you know came to the uk for the first time uh, i was doing a clinical attachment at that time and i asked my supervisor that i want to get involved and i got involved in a local site audit by the royal college of emergency medicine at that time so i think it's yeah. possible uh, people can help you people are very helpful generally in the uk but still the main question i get from the people is like if I, if you're not in the uk how can we do that so mm. i think there's a lot of lack of guidance so on my own page i usually share about qip as well i'm hoping to run a qip course as well so if somebody want to help so i can help them design a qip in their own setting yeah. so it can be done anywhere anywhere like it's not like you need to do be in the uk you do you don't need to be in the uk for that you can do it in your own settings whether it's primary care whether it's secondary or tertiary care so qip if you do two mm. cycles uh you, it can give you four marks so but if you have been done a full cycle if you done one cycle and you have been involved in all the stages of one cycle it can give you three marks so these three and four marks are easily doable and if you get three marks mm. in here present in as a poster in national conference you can easily score like eight marks mm. i think yeah, that's so, very important if, especially if you're working in uk people who are going for imt application they will have some degree of they definitely would have done some audit for yeah. qip because i see medical students doing that here as well and regarding developing portfolio i've always said to um, the junior doctors and the medical students that you know if you look at the cvs of the british medical students their cvs or their portfolio start to build well while they were still medical students you know so start doing yes. things like research and qips and and you know going to the conferences doing poster presentations this is something they start building up very uh, early in, in their career so this is why also whenever i go to pakistan i also ask people to actually start considering that you know when whenever there conferences happening all over the pakistan big big ma- big massive conferences try to start to involve yourself in, in in them to see how things are run there involve yourself in poster presentation earlier because what people do is you know they will come to you suddenly and say that the application is opening in the next next two months can you tell me something i can do quickly to get all the marks i mean that is usually not feasible yeah. you know that you 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 as you said you know that there is whenever you look at a portfolio a good portfolio for imt there is at least one year two years of work done on that in the in the past so thank you very much for telling us about the uh, self ranking criteria for the portfolio and as as you said you know this portfolio works need some some special consideration and time uh, earlier than yeah. the application because you know you need to have those things on 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 with you to score so once once you have done that you know once you think you have scored well enough whatever the the criteria what is whatever it is after 15 out of 40 or 20 out of 40 yeah. and you had you've been invited to the uh, interview stage what was your interview experience like what was what was actually happening there yeah so i think you will have at least one and a half month to prepare for the interview uh, yeah. so once you get shortlisted you are confident that you're going to inter- like you will get the you know interview invite so i think uh, start preparing at that point or even start preparing early like by the time you start fill your application you should be started preparing for interview as well but once you have confirmation that i am getting this interview then should be your final sprint you know to mm-hmm. to prepare yourself so the interview is also very structured uh, it has got uh, three i would say stations or three different you know questions or themes uh, and it really runs for approximately i would say 30 to 35 minutes Mm. uh or it could be 45 i'm not sure exactly but i think my ran around 30 to 35 minutes so mm. but it would be the same across the board across the uk so um the first question is already available on uh, the website as well so the first station is uh they ask you a first question which is about the application and achievements so you will get like 2 to 3 minutes to explain your about you know the achievements that you have so i really suggest don't you know repeat the achievements or you know the things you have you have mentioned already in the application all right so this is the opportunity to talk about those things but you can also add few things which you think they was they were not suitable for the you know for the application for example i talked about my youtube channel and my facebook which i used to create counseling and yeah. i have people like i have you know resident doctors group and all these things so this is where i talked about this and your passion for medicine you can talk about these things but mm. also you can highlight among those special you know the things that you have mentioned in your application so this is the first question which is about application and achievement so they will assess your application so that's why they will give you five marks there will be two interviewers one and two uh, who will be scoring you independently so they will give you five mark out of five marks each for application and achievements so whatever achievements you have mentioned in your application yeah 
uh, they will be scored or they will give you marks. So there's one scoring, which is for shortlisting. This is the other scoring, which is for your interview. So as long as, so if you have like three achievements, uh, better add the one which is relevant to medicine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you're working in, let's say A&E and you have done three audits and one of them is relevant to surgery, one is related to medicine in, in, mm -hmm. in, in its core. So better add that, that one, so it will give you more marks. All right. So the second point will be suitability for IMT. So this is very, uh, I would say, this is a very subjective question, like suitability for IMT. So there is no clear cut guidance about this question, like how they judge you or how they, you know, check your performance, like how they see that you are suitable for IMT. Yeah. My understanding is it's all about your application, your experience and your, how you are relevant to the role. For example, uh, somebody uh, like, I think in theory, if, if you have been working in medicine versus somebody who has been working in, uh, let's say, in surgery, uh, they will, he, the, work, the person who is working in medicine will have a slightly more advantage than the one who is working in surgery. So I think if you want to score higher in this marks, better. Mm -hmm. If you are in surgery, you can change your job. You know, like that's why one year marks. So if you change your job, you show your commitment to get into medicine. I have... I know someone who was in uh, surgery. He wanted to do medicine, so he changed his job, and then he, you know, that was a plus point for myself. Even I was in A and E when I filled the application, so mm. I worked in A and E for one and a half year. But A and E is kind of a different specialty, I would say. It is something from where you can mm. go into any subspecialty. So A and E skill set is kind of transferable to you know medicine or mm. surgery or applied specialties, but still. I was not in medicine, so I was a bit disadvantaged than somebody who was in medicine, but still I managed to score good in this mark. So I think um, this is how hmm. you can score well in suitability for IMT. Uh, try to add relevant uh, achievements. Rele if you have distinction, for example, as your undergraduate, you know, yeah. during your graduation, you can put that. If you have any medals or you have any, you know, any degrees, any separate, you know, anything. Hmm. If you have, well, for example, if you run a society. For example, if you have been a president for a society, one is a literary society and one is society for patient welfare or, yeah. you know, research education. Add that one, uh, that will give you more marks. Okay. I think I, I know so, about, I mean, just I add here, I know somebody who was working in psychiatry and who wanted to apply for IMT. And that okay. person and that person started to sort of show in the portfolio that in, even working in psychiatry, they were managing the medical emergencies, identifying yes. the medically unwell patient and managing them and speaking to the medical team. <clears throat> then they started to do some shadowing experience in, in medicine as well. Then they also mm -hmm. did started to do some locums within within the NHS, you know, that they started to do some locums mm -hmm. in medicine. So mm -hmm. by doing that, they were trying to uh, to build up their portfolio, mm -hmm. whatever you call an impression that, you know, they are also yes. exposing, uh, exposing themselves to medicine and have that experience prior to starting IMT. I just wanted yeah. to give that example because I know that somebody did that when, when they were working with us. Yeah, that, that definitely worked, you know, because <laughs> there is, if you go to the application or to the website, there is no clear cut, you know, mentioning of that you should be working in medicine, for example. Yeah. It's all suitability for IMT. As long as you can show that even you are in surgery, uh, but you are managing, you know, like hyperkalemia or you are, you know, interested in those suspects yeah. of managing medical patients and you are, let's say you are doing an audit, yeah. which you know, manages these things, uh, like the medical aspects of the things, then do you show commitment to the speciality, you show you are committed to medicine and even psychiatry in pediatric surgery, whatever the speciality is, at least you can, it's not the dead end, you can mm -hmm. do a lot of things to whatever specialty you're in. Mm -hmm. And then I would say the third question, so the second question, like second question would be about ethical professionalism and governance. Yeah. So this is, you know, the typical question that I think is part of the most UH, NHS interviews. Uh, even in PLAB 2, uh, you will have seen the dissertation about ethical and all those things. So this is about, you know, it's so, the, so to, if you want to prepare for this, I think there are a couple of, you know, resources available. So I just want to highlight, there's a book called Medical Interviews. You can buy that book. Yeah. Uh, and you have, have, I think it might have more than 20, 250 scenarios about different domains of ethical yeah. and professionalism. So go through all those scenarios. Uh, even if you can't go through all of them, at least go through the ones which have common themes, you know, like if there are 10 questions on the same thing, at least go through two or three. Yeah. But give yourself a time to understand what the core answers would be, you know, and I, I would bet the question they will ask in the interview will be out of those scenarios because uh, the scenarios will be the same. The core, you know, the framework or the answers, the principle and the, you know, the ethical, you know, the guidelines will be the same. It's just the wording that may change. So as long as we have prepared well in this in this scenario, yeah. it will help you have a good impression of overall understanding of the, how the 
NHS health system works. So that's how you can do as well. And can then give, you some, the, give us some examples of what kind of questions are asked in ethical scenarios. All right. So I would say like the, uh, the one question, for example, would be if you have, for example, I think, so the main question is, it's not too tricky. For example, the same question you will be asking Clav as well. For example, there's a colleague who is coming late, you know, and the same question is asked in the MSRA SJD part as well. There's a colleague uh, who's working with you and he's coming late, you know, it's been like five days, he's coming late daily. And you're a bit concerned because you've been overworked. You are like, you, you're you seeing his patients as well. And you are, you are leaving late now from the ward. So how will you approach this scenario? Yeah. Okay, so this is a very common question, uh, and they are relevant sister questions as well. You know, like similar, like related to colleagues, uh, related to your supervisor, related to patient safety. For example, there would be a question like you have a patient who, who approach you out of you know out of the working hours, like personally on social media profile or something. How will you handle this situation? Yeah. So, because the, these books and resources are important, because you can't think of the scenarios that mm. can happen. Uh, unless you have been working in the NHS for 10, 15 years, because you won't come across all the ethical dilemmas in two to three years. So these help you understand, okay, so these all these things can happen, like having a relationship with colleagues, you know, have yeah. professionalism, how the teamwork works. So this is very good. Uh, so this is the, the one I gave you is very um, generic question, I would say. And my question, I won't share the exact question, but I would say it was along the lines that I have prepared you know, during yeah. my preparation. So I won't say it was kind of a surprise for me. I exactly knew what I need yeah. to tell to them, yeah. what the underlying principles are. Yes, that's fine. So that's the second question. The third yeah. is clinical scenario. Uh, it has got three yeah. components. The first component is, so how it works is they will give you, they will show, I think they will show a question on the screen. Same for the ethical as well. Yeah. And same for this one. They will show a question on the screen. They will give you, I think, uh, five 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 minutes to read that question and then to understand and then they will ask you uh, what your you know like how will you approach this scenario so what you need to talk about is you know you how will you approach your initial approach like abcd approach or if it's an emergency situation if it's an outpatient setting then how will you approach this question usually i think most of the questions are like an emergency ones you know the same you do in your sd12 interviews in the uk or ireland or you know other countries so you talk about how you approach the patient, uh, what kind of investigations you would do, what your impression is, what your differentials are, and how will you further manage this patient, you know, like treatment. So this is uh, this is like a, a standard practice, standard yeah. question. Mm -hmm. So for this one, I think you can prepare from Oxford uh, handbook. Um, I use the Oxford handbook of clinical medicine as well as the emergency medicine. Mm -hmm. um, there's a section called emergencies in the in the last, you know, in the last of this book so like i think 30 to 40 pages uh, 20 to 25 topics which have uh, like algorithms you know how you manage these patients uh, and it's very important to learn all the details by heart because if you are just saying you know um, lt plays and saying lt plays and this dose will make a much different you know it's, it's give you more better impression than what you know about this for example memory embolism and all these things mm -hmm. so you can prepare from oxford uh, there are other private you know websites as well um there are a couple of them across the across the board so i used one of them as well they were quite good you know they give you a scenario then all these breakdowns you can read about it so yeah. i think it's very they are a bit expensive like they can cost you like 80 to 100 pounds but they're really good so i think it's worth investing in your yeah. for your portfolio so this is the third uh, so this is the third question uh, about the clinical scenario then you have to have a patient handover for the same scenario. So once you have talked about investigation, yeah. management, approach, then they will ask you, now uh, you have someone like your specialty registrar or your night shift you know, colleague who is at the same level, uh, then just try to hand over this patient. And so this is, there is called, you know, a SBAR approach, which is standard mm -hmm. across the UK. So you need to practice that, that because all of this is going in a real time. So you won't have, you know, plenty of time to to think about what is relevant and what is not so unless you have practiced a lot mm -hmm. you will struggle in the interview so i think start practicing in your daily life as well so if you're working just try to whenever you talk about somebody to the nurse to the health professionals try to approach you know try to understand the information consolidate it and then mm -hmm. organize it in a like present in organized form in an as bar approach. So this is the patient handover thing. So, and the third point is the communication skills. So there's no specific question for that. They will judge you throughout your you know interview and yeah. how you communicate 
skills are, whether you are talking too loud, too soft, you know, and yeah. too, uh, you know, because I, what I worked on is like, I used to think like I'm working, I'm like, I'm, I speak very fast at times and I don't realize myself. So how I prepare for the interview, uh, that's a different story. Uh, I used to sit down, read all the questions and then record myself on my laptop or my my mobile i've all still i have all these videos you know in my laptop that i, I used to record myself and see where i am lacking you know what my you mm. know where you know feeling have, having these filler words and where my body language is not appropriate and you know where my accent or it's not clear so i think uh, that's very helpful for me you know like in practicing in front of mirror it's an old thing now it's, you know the digital age you can practice in front of your laptop record mm. yourself listen to yourself and then write down the points okay i don't need to make this mistake in the next video and keep doing that and ultimately you will have you know become very very confident you know it's it's kind of a role playing you know that you do in yeah. lab too the more you practice the more better you get but still you have to have that element of your natural you know uh, yeah. uh, your personalized approach as well so don't be too generic don't be too robotic but still you need practice I think I, I'm not sure if we covered that, but this interview is not face to face. You know, is it, this is this is online. You're doing it. Is that right? yes, yeah. So this is not face to face. This is yeah. uh, I think I'm not sure when it, when it used to be face to face, but I think since COVID, it's all yeah. online, and they don't have any plans to change it to face to face yeah. in the near future. And for these, you know, online interviews, I like for you know face to face, we prepare a lot of things. Like for example, if you're in a different city, you prepare the, your tickets and you know your um, your accommodation and all those things but for i'm not sure why we take it granted if there is a virtual interview we don't prepare well uh, we don't invest on the device we don't invest on the voice so i made sure that i'm in a comfortable and quiet environment uh, i just opened the window so <laughs> this is a bit noisy but at that time you need to be make sure that you're not that much noisy you're dressing some people say it matters some people say it doesn't so i'm not going to go into that debate uh, for me it, it helps, I would say, you know, a little bit with, uh, you know, the, the, your all, your overall persona that helps you, uh, you yeah. know, kind of give you a bit of an advantage, I would say. And then uh, microphone, it is very important. If you don't have, you know, a good microphone in the, in the laptop, uh, then I think it's better by one. It will help you to, you know, because what happens is if you, even watching a movie, like when you watch a movie, if there's a movie with, you know, better sound, you tend to watch it more, clear, you know, you understand it better. Yeah. Why not? Give that you know privilege yeah. or give that you know facility to the interviewers as well. Let them listen to you clearly and carefully, and invest a little bit on it. Will be like 15, 20 pounds, nothing much, and in Pakistan it will be like fifteen hundred something. So invest on that. Invest on your devices. Mm -hmm. Make sure the lighting is appropriate. There's no much shadows and all those things. There are no marks for these things in the interview, yeah. but I think they can influence your interview with some. In, no, in I think it's, uh, definitely. I think for any in online interview, not just for IMT, even for if you're going for a job interview, I will always ask people all the things you have you have just mentioned, because sometimes yeah. it is important that your voice is heard clearly as well. Because if they can't hear you clearly, they won't be able to get an impression of how confident yeah. you are in answering, and and you know they might ask to ask you to repeat something again that will waste time, and it might give you an impression that you're not doing well because they're asking to repeat. And it's not yeah. just that because it might just be that because your mic is not good. So I yeah. think to test it, um, and usually laptop mics, if you're doing it, you will create a lot of echo. So if it's better to sort of invest in something like a headphone or a or a yeah. or a mic which is separate from your 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 laptop mic to 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 have your voice more uh, more clear. Now I think thank yeah. you thank you very much for giving us an overall re review of uh, how the IMT application process works. You know. The starting from submitting your application, CRAS form, then the self scoring of your portfolio, then to the interview stage. And after this stage, did you do you get like a marks, overall marks, and then those are used for ranking different places in within UK nationally? Is that how it works? Yeah. So after the interview and your overall score, you know, yeah. uh, you get your you get to know your score, and then you get a rank uh, yeah. among all the part of the applicants who were shortlisted so and then um, there are vacancies which has been published before during the application stage so you may have given the preference i think you can change the preference at any point till you know the first before yeah. the first was released so you can keep on changing the preference as per yeah. your rank as well sometimes so you get the rank then you arrange your preferences and then you get the offer so i think mm. two three four rounds of offers they yeah. keep coming 
the keeper ending and if you want to accept you accept if you don't then you just put in a hold or mm -hmm. wait for the upgrade uh, and the, this is how it works you know like it depends on the vac vacancies i think last year it was like 1500 uh, 1600 or something vacancies across the uk including northern ireland mm -hmm. uh, i'm not sure about this year but they will okay. be out soon yeah i think it's around 1500 uh, averagely you know it could be a Plus minus fifteen hundred. Yeah, but I have seen people with like uh, one of my close friends, like with, with so it's not like if you have haven't got the fifteen hundred rank, you, you won't get it. So one of my close friends, I think the last year, the last number was approximately around twenty five hundred and fifty. Yeah, so yeah. The last yeah. was got this. So this is not end of the world. So even yeah. if you have scored like more than the vacancies available, you still can have good you know, chance. Yeah, I think that is that's true for every lot of other other specialties because people are applying for multiple specialties. So same somebody who yeah. might have applied for MT may have got an offer from GP or psychiatry or yeah. something else. You know, they might go for that. Yeah. yeah. And some people who want to be in a specific place, they don't get that, and then later they withdraw mm -hmm. their application. So yeah. like people have their family, you know, reasons and social reasons to stay at one place. So mm -hmm. if you're flexible, if you want to move, you can. Mm -hmm. I think. Under two thousand this year, you will get a decent place to decent to, place, work. Yeah, to work. Yeah. So thank you very much for giving me the time, you know, and uh, sharing your experience. I think it was very useful, and especially for the upcoming future IMT yeah. trainees. I hope they will benefit a lot from um, from understanding uh, the process and also uh, listening to your experience as well. Thank you again. No worries. Thank you so much.